Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Friday to you all. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Stephanie Anderson, and I'm the Industry Operations Manager for the National Apartment Association. I'm also the staff liaison for the Independent Rental Owners Committee. I'm really excited to be here today, and we have two fantastic speakers joining us. But before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items I want to address. First, there is a question and answer box that you'll see. Please feel free to enter any questions that you have for our presenters today. We'll try to hold all questions until the end. We'll save about 10 minutes after wrap up. That way we can answer any questions you have. So feel free to go ahead and enter those in. Um, our hope is that we'll answer them before we even get to the end. But if we don't, please know that we will answer them momentarily. Also, there is a chat box. If you need to send myself a message, please let me know. In addition, we'll be recording this webinar for later access. It should be posted probably in the next couple of days. It will be on the Independent Rental Owners page on our NAA website, which is naahq.org. Now let's get started to the great stuff. It's my pleasure today to introduce a great webinar for flexible and vacation rental options for IROs. Joining us today is Mia Wentworth, who has over 12 years of experience in marketing and operations within the multifamily industry and her current role as Director of Digital Marketing with CWS Apartment Homes. Also joining us is Ms. Lori Valentini Webb. She's the owner and broker of Property Specific Realty and the owner of Property Playbook, a real estate marketing firm. She has had previously over 10 years experience as a director of multifamily. Welcome ladies. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That was actually a great intro. Um, as Stephanie said, I own the brokerage property specific. My husband and I own um, about 10 or 12 single family rental properties. We own this beach property, uh, short term vacation rental, and also we're co-owners of a small multifamily development. So we work um, every day in real estate and uh, with a lot of our investor friends. Also own the firm Property Playbook for real estate marketing. So marketing is my background, what I come from, from the corporate world. So I've got a lot of experience in that. So I'm glad to be here. Um, and hi, I'm Mia Wentworth. I work as the Director of Digital Marketing for CWS Apartment Homes. Um, but as a side business, my husband and I run four short-term rentals in um, Breckenridge, Colorado and Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Um, so for us, it's, um, you know, it's a little bit of a side business, but, you know, we'd like to continue to grow our portfolios and we have learned some things along the way. So that's uh, what I'm excited to talk to you guys about besides, besides my background in multifamily. So um, you were going to get into how we chose our markets, but there are a lot of tools available if you're not already familiar with short-term rentals. So, you know, you can always look at your competitors on Airbnb or Verbo or whatever site and get an idea for what your rental rates would be. But another great tool that I have found uh, when I get a little apprehensive about getting into a new market is a tool called AirDNA.com. Um, and it, 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 there is a fee to use it, and I have not actually ever purchased the extended version just because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't want to spend the money. But there are some free resources available as well. If you go to the website, you can plug in a zip code, and it will show you um, some general occupancy trends as well as rates depending on uh, the size of the unit. So, you know, it, you know, it's one thing when you're comfortable with the market. Like, so for us, I'll get into it, but Breckenridge is close to home. It was a little bit easier uh, when we thought about investing there, but Gatlinburg, Tennessee is four states away. I live in Denver, Colorado, so it was a little bit scarier to get into that market, and air &E, uh, certainly helped as a resource to give us um, just a little bit of idea on what short-term rentals we're doing in the area. Stephanie, you can go to the next slide. So how did we choose our market? For, um, for myself personally, I'm a real estate investor. Um, that means that when I'm on vacations, I am always looking for opportunities. Um, 
for me personally, I wanted to have something that I was going to have as a rental investment, but then also was going to be able to personally enjoy some times of the year. So that was um, a big factor for us. We decided on Polly's Island because it was, uh, it's in South Carolina. It's about 20, 25 minutes from Myrtle Beach. It's a little bit more of a sleepier town. So that was something that appealed to us, but then also we knew it would appeal to the masses because it was quite close to Myrtle Beach and had a lot of things going on. Um, and then there's many other pockets and areas that are very touristy around there. So we knew that it would be a good draw for people. We loved the resort. Um, it offered tons of amenities, which is something that when we were searching for um, the right short-term rental or vacation rental, it was certainly important for people to have the pools and things like that. So we looked for all of that in a resort complex. And then um, we just happened to be searching, you know, we're always talking with um, brokers in the markets that we're looking at to see if there's anything, any diamonds in the rough. And, and there was one beachfront at this particular resort um, that was undervalued. It was much lower than most of the comps in the area. And I'll explain why in a little bit. Um, it had sat on the market for about a year. So we were very excited. And again, just because it was right beachfront, that was something that was certainly appealing to us. We knew that it would be able to stay rented for quite some time. So we chose Polly's Island for both rental investment and for our own personal enjoyment. Yeah, so for us, um, you know, similar to Lori, we were looking for a place originally just to have a vacation ski condo. Um, we were not looking at it originally as investment opportunity. So, you know, in, if you're familiar with Denver, Denver is about two hours away from the ski areas. And in inclement weather, you can get stranded up there mm -hmm. if the roads get shut down. And, um, you know, there's a lot of benefit to having a place local where you can stay, where you don't have to drive up and back in the same day. So, you know, that's originally how we started looking at Breckenridge. And, um, you know, of course, it's, a, it's rather seasonal, uh, so that's something that you'll want to factor in, and I think Lori will talk about it as well for her market. You know, beach markets op opposite seasonality as a ski town, but, um, you know, there's a little bit of seasonality you have to factor in when you're thinking of your expenses. Um, but uh, Breckenridge, you know, really attracts people from all around the world, which is kind of fantastic and interesting to see where some of our guests come from. Um, and, you know, investing in a ski town, of course, being close to the ski lifts is very, very important. And it's actually very interesting if you start to look at the real estate in a market like Breckenridge, um, the price differential for that location-based uh, ski in, ski out type condo is um, pretty big. And, you know, I think when you're talking about investing, you have to figure out, you know, what's more important to you. And sometimes, of course, cost of entry is, um, is it and it's all you can afford but you know when you think about renting it to other people and having other people help you pay <laughs> for your vacation place um, you know having that ski in certainly helps in the busy season um, and I will say you know originally when we got into Breckenridge it was just so that we could have that vacation place and then we were like well it'd be great if somebody else would sort of help us pay the mortgage and then we just have a place to stay and you know what we quickly realized is that it, it's absolutely more of a business opportunity than just that vacation rental so once we realized that um, you know we're making a little bit of extra money here besides just being able to vacation that's when we decided to go ahead and buy a second unit in Breckenridge so it's a little bit about Breckenridge Colorado um, our other market is Gatlinburg Tennessee um, and Gatlinburg Tennessee for us was our first foray into really looking at vacation rental market as an investment. So Gatlinburg is the most, um, it's the gateway to the Smoky Mountain National Park. If you've never been there, it's beautiful and it's called Smoky because of, you can sort of see in this picture here, but the, the, the way the trees are, it sort of traps some of that moisture and it gives us this beautiful smoky look. Um, but it's a free national park and for that reason, as well as it's central, you know, a lot of people can drive in. Um, it's the most visited national park in the United States. Um, so we really looked at that area as, um, you know, yes, a place for us to vacation, but that was our first entry into more looking at it as, a, as, as an investment. Um, you know, it attracts families, 
we'll get into some of the amenities and things, but people who are coming in big groups love all the games, like billiard tables and having a hot tub on your deck is like a must there, which is funny because it is warm a lot of the, a lot of the year, but you know, there are a lot of little things that people look for when they're going to visit um, the Smoky Mountains. So those are our, our two markets. Cool. Okay, so lots of things to talk about. Um, what I will say is I mentioned we have single family rentals and we had always had that. Since we've had this vacation property rental, short term rental, um, our cash flow monthly is about three times what our uh, profit is on the single family homes that we rent out long term. So it's definitely um, a smart investment as long as you do all of the due diligence up front. What we were going to do once we were able to identify that unit that I said was really undervalued, we went to the management company that does most of the rentals in the entire resort um, and got some details about what they receive as income and how often places stay occupied. So we certainly had to weigh out if we felt it was going to be profitable for us. Um, this property in particular needed a massive renovation. So we knew that we were gonna have to factor in that. A lot of these um, homes that you buy come with furniture, but I certainly, that $50,000 renovation budget, I was including in furniture, but when you have to buy all new furniture, that is a big component. Um, so it's certainly something to be mindful of. $50,000 was um, not the right number. And um, we were lucky enough. I had been, I had reached out to HGTV a while back because we do do a lot of real estate. Um, and we were interested in working with them on a show because they provide some um, some bonuses when you are able to get with them on that. And they wanted to work with us on a beach rental. So lucky enough for us, they provided about $25,000 in furniture because we did shoot our renovation for that. So that saved us a little bit on the budget. Our overall renovation budget was about $40,000. And again, this is South Carolina. So that's you know uh, relatively cheaper than a lot of other markets uh, where a big scale renovation could be a big factor. So of course, when you're running the numbers, always acknowledge if there's going to be um, a big renovation factor, and then furnishing the investment. I I drastically under budgeted what that would cost us. Um, our HOAs are very high, and they're high because of the amenities, but the meticulous care that the property managers and um, the maintenance team take, you know, it's it's what we pay for with those HOAs, but they're extremely high. Um, and then our advertising costs are really low. We do it all mostly ourselves. We pay VRBO um, a yearly amount, but it's very minimal. And then um, I even think with um, the other, we're, we're basically only on VRBO and um, Airbnb at this point, but there's a couple other options and all of them are very inexpensive to advertise on. So our advertising costs were lower than what was anticipated um, and our um, furniture costs and renovation costs were a little bit higher. We decided to manage it ourselves because we've got a lot of that experience and this particular management company and a lot of these short term and vacation rentals are very expensive, somewhere between 25 to 40% in management costs. And we stay far more occupied than any of the other units in the majority of the entire complex, the whole resort um, altogether. So it's way more advantageous for us to manage it on our own with having um, just our, our dedicated vendors, including housekeepers, maids, um, and then GCs if we ever need anything uh, for maintenance wise. So that has been a cost that we've been able to avoid, which has added to our profit. And then what we've learned, you know, that we're going into year three, the first two years we have stayed extremely occupied. Um, it is just a combination of getting good reviews, friend referrals. We'll talk a lot about the marketing towards the latter portion. But what I did note um, the first year in is during our busy time, it was, um, we were able to maximize our profit much more if we did week long stays. Uh, we missed the boat on that that first year, but the second year we learned fast and we 
charge, you know, we, we only allowed for Sunday to Saturday, and that was to minimize those one or two off days where people might not book. We really wanted to maximize as much profit as we could get so that it would balance off, you know, during the winter time when we're a little bit slower. Although, you know, in the last two years, we haven't been very slow. You get to really know your market. Our market is also a huge golf area. So there's a lot of people that will stay for the full month um, to get all of their golfing in or if they're coming for um, any kind of league tournaments and things like that. So oftentimes we'll rent out for the month rather than just short term like this day to day or week to week. Um, so that has allowed us to really profit during those um, slower months as well. So during the the high months those peak months we do week long required and then we shift around our minimum nightly occupancy just based on the time of year and the market etc so i mentioned renovation so um we often go into projects where we can see where we can add some value and we certainly thought because this was beachfront if we got this a lot lower than you know you can see on the right hand side why it's sat on the market for a year um, we knew that if we were able to wow people with this renovation that we were going to have a property that was going to be gorgeous and of course for hgtv um, in order to film it it really needed to be um, a wow type of renovation so again our renovation budget on this was roughly about forty thousand dollars that was taken into account when we were determining all of the costs on the proper property and then what our um, cash flow is month to month this set us you know, it, it left us, uh, once we closed, we were about six to eight weeks um, to do the production shoot and the renovation of this property, but it came out fantastic. We had a GC and uh, the GC and my husband and myself did um, did all of the work on here. So you can flip through. Um, the next one is, you know, a scary bathroom. Um, the, the property itself, prior to us getting it, it was a, a group of, I think, 11, um, older couples that were a part of um, a group that just stayed whenever they wanted to. And then they, they would rent it out, um, not fairly regularly, but enough so that we could see um, what they were renting it for when they did do short-term rentals. Um, and we knew that there was an absolute um, potential for us if we upgraded this to look fantastic to get um, you know, a huge increase on what the rentals were getting. Um, so that's our bathroom reno. And then, you know, again, the entire place was redone um, and it was done very well with, with people's taste in mind. And then of course, you gotta keep in mind that you're gonna get some wear and tear on these places. So we put in um, very durable, like LVT flooring. Um, we did a lot of furniture that has the, the coverings over them so that you can take those off and then furniture that looked expensive, but you know, we bought from like the Wayfairs and the Jocelyn Main so that it wasn't gonna break the bank. Um, again, our furniture ballpark to um, furnish this place was about $25,000. Um, our place is about 1800 square feet. It's three bedrooms. So it's actually pretty spacious place. Um, so keep that in mind as you're preparing for these. But then the other thing that you know, you don't really think about until the end is that you've got to have all the furnishings as well. So not just the furniture, but you've got to have the place furnished with the utensils and glasses. And so all of that stuff came with the, the one that we purchased, um, but it was extremely dated, really old. The towels were, you know, just not pretty in any, by any means. So a lot of that we had to replace. Um, and this is our, you know, the master bedroom. Um, we really just tried to go in for some really nice wow factors. And again, try to get things that we knew were gonna be durable for people. One thing I will make mention of since I'm talking about furnishings is our company that does the maid service, the cleaning service and the turn service. Um, we occasionally will have them, you know, once a quarter do a little bit of an inventory and things run off. I mean. For some reason, people love to take coffee makers, um, uh, some towels and stuff like that. So you really got to kind of keep a gauge on your inventory so that you, um, you know, you know if someone's 
has taken something that could be of good value. We have been lucky. It has all been um, little minor types of things that, that we've been able to catch pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> so besides, you know, we're going to talk a lot about, of course, how we're running the business, but, you know, if you're thinking about dipping your toe in the water, there are certainly other ways to get into the business. You know, buying a property can be expensive. You have to come up with that down payment, whatever that looks like. If you have to do a renovation and furnish it, like Lori just mentioned, um, you know, there's a lot of other ways people are making a business out of short-term rentals without uh, going all in on buying their properties. So one way, of course, is rental arbitrage. And as an independent rental owner, I think that's most of the audience on this on this webinar today. But, you know, I, I don't know if you've had anyone approach you asking you to do that. But in some of the groups that I follow, it's, it's a way that a lot of them are building their business quickly without having that um, initial investment money. So, you know, that's certainly a way to get in. A lot of other people are offering co-hosting um, co-hosting services. So it's a, it's a little bit less than a full-on management company, like what Lori was mentioning. It's more like somebody who is local, who you can tap to, you know, sort of be that local resource, maybe meet the guests if you really want to meet the guests when they're checking in, that kind of thing. And, and people are offering this for a lower fee. You know, I think Lori threw out 35%. We've seen anywhere from, you know, 25 to 40% management fees, whereas co-hosting people seem to be offering that for maybe more like a 10% fee. Um, and they're kind of running you know, your calendar for you and perhaps meeting your guests um, for people who want to be a little bit more hands off. Um, and, you know, we've also seen a lot of people getting into the business by providing a service for short term rental. So specific, you know, like, you know, Lori mentioned her cleaner. Of course, that's one very specific, you know, our cleaner in both of our locations um, is specific to short term rental. It's not a house cleaner who you'd hire to come clean your house once a month. You know, it's somebody who has enough staff and flexibility to match your calendar and be available between those hours of whatever it is, 10, 10 a.m. checkout to 4 p.m. check in or whatever that is. Um, so there's a lot of people offering these other services, um, you know, just as a way to make some money with this whole new economy. So I just think that's always interesting to talk about all these new ways you can maybe get into the business, dip your toe in without even going full on. So, <clears throat> um, you know, I think Lori talked a lot about furnishings. When you are furnishing your short-term rental, I think it's important to keep in mind that people a lot of times are expecting something a bit nicer than home. You know, they are renting an experience. So, you know, especially when we talk about our vacation areas, um, you know, in, in the ski area, people are looking, you know, people are coming to ski. So having that fireplace. And so that picture on the right there is um, a chairlift bench next to a fireplace. And, you know, that was expensive. It was 1800 bucks for us to buy this chairlift bench, but people love it. And I have that little, um, oh, what are those little word board signs? I have that in there. And it's so funny because I don't make it to the condo that often because we have a cleaner and it's, probably 75% of the time that I go there and there's been a message left that I can tell somebody posed in that chair left and took a picture. I've seen pregnancy announcements and engagement announcements and all kinds of things like people like creating this little moment in the chair left. So it was expensive, but I think it's one thing that makes our, our condo there stand out a little bit. And then the other um, picture are some rocking chairs that's in the Smokies. And again, that's a very Smoky Mountain thing. When you look through rentals there, you'll see a lot of rocking chairs on porches. And if you can just have this feeling of sitting out there with your morning coffee and enjoying the sunrise and in uh, the view and, um, you know, it's just, it's just little touches like that, that I think are very, very important to keep in mind when you're furnishing the place. Like, don't just go to Ikea and buy everything from Ikea <laughs> and make it look like an Ikea showroom, right? Like figure out what it is that's a little bit special about your location that you can do to make uh, your listing photos stand out and make people really appreciate the experience that they're having inside of your rentals. Uh, and then Lori, I think you also mentioned you guys, you have like branded gifts, don't you? Yeah. So marketing person over here, we named our property. It's called Spiagia and, um, you know, I've noticed an absolute direct correlation between how much money you can ask for your rentals and your reviews and ratings. So one mm -hmm. of my main the positioning I went in with all of this is, of course, to like create the best memory and have people leave on a note where they are just so happy that they that they came. So um, 
we actually have the maid service bring um, some branded gifts. We've got a wine opener, um, some lip balm, um, a spiaggia towel that's left for them when they enter the place. And so by them leaving with some really nice goodbye gifts, um, it's mentioned in a lot of our reviews. People really appreciate that. So that has given us a little bit of a leg up on um, really reminding people to like, you know, leave us a good thank you and a great review um, when they're, when they visited. Um, so, you know, talking about operations a little bit, you know, again, I think this webinar is sort of catered towards, you know, independent owners. So you're probably somewhat used to the operations, but, you know, there's a lot of things to keep in mind. Like Lori mentioned, if you, um, are just doing bookings on Airbnb and Verbo, they'll do your marketing for you basically. Um, so you don't necessarily have to pay for that. Um, but you know, there are a lot of people who do allow direct bookings. And if that's something that you want to allow, I think there's a lot of things to keep in mind. So number one, you have to figure out a payment platform, of course, to accept that money, whatever that looks like. Um, and I think the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, you hear a little bit of bad press around short-term rentals and you know that'll always be the case because the good stories don't make the news right so you know i've been doing this for a couple of years now we've only had one bad experience where somebody broke something and she actually paid for it so um you know you hear the bad stories but they're few and far between um but that doesn't mean that you don't want to somehow have a way to screen your people so i think you know as as much as you hear about some of these things airbnb and verbo still do a, a bit of um, data gathering, you know, in terms of the person and matching perhaps their ID or their email or whatever it is, you know, and also payments. Um, so, you know, it's just something to think about. I don't offer direct bookings right now unless it's friend and family. And then I just have them pay me directly through PayPal or Venmo. But, you know, something, something to think about. You can certainly save some money on the platform fees if you want to offer that. I think you just have to think about, um, you know, things like chargebacks and, and checking on who it is who's staying in your rental if you do want to allow those direct bookings. Um, you know, so for example, Lori mentioned there's some other platforms out there. I know booking.com is another big one, but I have heard um, a little bit more issue with fraud on booking.com for whatever reason. So I don't want to bad mouth them. I, you know, I don't know. I've not, I've not dipped my toe in the water because I'm a little bit scared about that, but I don't know what it is that they don't verify that Verbo and Airbnb do, but um, just something to think about. Um, you know, talking about managing receipts and taxes, again, it's something you're probably used to doing for your long-term rental. Uh, however, when you have a short-term rental, you've got a lot more money coming in and going out, you know, quicker than a long-term rental. So I think it's just something to think and, you know, keep in mind. You're not just collecting rent once a month. You've got receipts coming in every few days as people are checking in. You've got the deposits going back out, that kind of thing. Uh, so it's just maybe a little bit more managing your receipts and accounting. Um, since we don't have long-term rentals myself, we just use a simple free accounting software called Wave, and uh, we have it linked to our bank accounts, and that helps us keep track. Uh, you know, again, if you guys have long-term rentals, you probably have a method, but it's just something to keep in mind that you're going to have a lot more money flowing in and out. Um, and then, of course, keeping up on the taxes, whatever that looks like in your area. Um, and, yeah, I think it's important to check the platform because in some areas, Airbnb and Verbo have – um, an agreement with the local city that they're going to pay your hospitality hospitality taxes on your behalf. And I think that's their way of maintaining good graces <laughs> in certain cities <laughs> who maybe, you know, think that people are using the system and then getting away with their taxes. So it's just something to keep in mind. They don't do it in every city, but um, in Breckenridge, they do take our hospitality taxes. Um, and in Gatlinburg, Verbo does. So it's just something you'd want to check in on. Uh, when you talk about rules and regulations for the property, I do think it's important to have some rules and regulations that are uploaded to, you know, both Airbnb and Verbo, and it just helps protect you a bit, you know, if something were to happen. Um, I think besides protection, it's also a matter of keeping your neighbors happy. So if you are in a vacation rental area, your neighbors are probably a lot more used to having people coming and going. But, you know, I know the big, you know, trend is people are starting to look at 
of course, Airbnb and Verbo in bigger cities, you know, when it's not a traditional vacation rental market, I think that's a lot of times when you have that friction with the neighbors. So, you know, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying, I think you need to be careful and make sure that you're taking uh, precautions to keep people <laughs> behaving in a way that doesn't upset your neighbors. Your neighbor doesn't want, you know, a pool party next door <laughs> in your short-term rental when they have, you know, their kids who are uh, trying to go to bed for school the next day or whatever it is. So, um, oh, and then I have the clear expectation for your guests. Again, that's just because you don't want I feel like when I see regulations popping up in cities, it's usually because something has happened to make the neighborhood upset. So, um, you know, in, in our case, going into vacation areas, I, I, I don't see them going away anytime soon because they're so used to it. But when you talk about doing it in the city, uh, you know, it's a good way to get Airbnb shut down for your whole city if you're not doing it responsibly. So um, I think next on operations, you know, Finding the right cleaning partner is very important. You know, I mentioned it's important, I think, to have somebody who's used to that short-term uh, or, or maybe specializes in short-term rental cleans instead of just the standard cleaner. Not to say somebody else couldn't do it. You just need to make sure they have that flexibility to keep up with your schedule. Um, and then you also need to make sure they're, you know, they're doing things right. So Lori mentioned reviews, and we'll talk about that again in a little bit, but reviews are huge. So when you think about somebody renting a short-term rental versus a long-term, in the long-term, they can come out and tour, they can take a look, they can make up their mind. Short-term, you know, it's all the pictures online and it's all the reviews. So, you know, if you have a cleaner who, I mean, you hear, you know, you hear the little things like left the hair in the drain or, you know, little mm -hmm. things that would make you feel like the place is not clean, that'll pop up in a review. So you need to make sure you've got a good cleaner. Um, and, you know, if you're going to manage them from long distance, it can be a challenge. So, you know, our Breckenridge places are a lot easier for me to get up to and kind of audit and make sure she's doing a great job. Whereas the Gatlinburg places, I have to rely on them a lot more, um, you know, and trust that they're doing a good job. And I think one way to do that when you do first launch your listing is to ask your guests for that honest feedback. And so, you know, when I launch a new listing in Gatlinburg, I'll just say like, hey, it's a, you know, this is a brand new listing for us. I'd really, really appreciate your private feedback if there's anything that could be improved. And hopefully you can take that feedback and you know, hopefully your cleaner is doing a great job, but if not, um, you can make a change. And we did actually have to fire one of our cleaners in Gallenberg um, because she <laughs> she kept missing some stuff. So it's never, you know, never a fun conversation to have, but your reviews are depending on it. So um, you know, it's, it's very, very important. You know, I think the other thing to keep in mind is when you talk about short-term rental, um, Ours are all keyless. I can't, you know, I can't imagine trying to keep track of keys. We have keys at all of the locations in lock boxes as a backup in case there was something to happen, you know, in, in case the lock fails or the battery, there's always, you know, potential things that could happen, but they're in a lock box. Nobody has access to them unless I give them that code. So it's just all keyless, keyless entry with a code. That way you can also change the code so that you don't have guests who have your code. <laughs> for a year from now and they're coming back to your property you can change the code um and then one of our um one of our cabins is in a little bit more of a rural area and so that is the only one actually that we do have a security system on um and, you know I, it, it gives us more peace of mind i think than than the, that we've ever had to use it um you know it also lets us regulate our thermostat which is nice so it's per, you know it's programmed and it um, knows when somebody's been away for more than an hour and it it resets to the away settings and saves us some money on our utilities. So, you know, I think that's absolutely been worth it for us. Uh, we've debated on our other cabin and just haven't decided because we have uh, neighbors who are a little bit closer. Of course, it's a little bit of an extra expense, but I think it's something to consider. Um, I do think it's important. I have a, a bullet point here on camera rules and disclosure. You are not allowed to have cameras inside of your listing. I mean, I guess <laughs> maybe that sounds like common sense, but people don't want to be filmed when they're <laughs> when they're in um, you know the private areas of your home. Um, and you are supposed to disclose that you have a doorbell camera if you do have one outside. Um, you know, again, not, not a huge deal. I think maybe a lot of people expect to see a ring camera, but if that's something you install, it's important that you let your guests know that the exterior is being monitored. All right, reputation. So, 
you know, we mentioned the difference between short-term and long-term rentals. You know, if, if things go wrong in a short-term, you have to fix it quickly because they're only there for a couple of days versus long-term. Not that you don't want to take good care of your long-term renters, but you know what I mean. It, it, somebody's there for a couple of days, you need to get it fixed. So it's very, very important, of course, to have those partners who can make those kinds of repairs for you quickly. Um, and then, you know, in, in a certain instance, perhaps you have to offer some kind of a credit and that's something to think about as well. Now, I hate to offer a credit, but every once in a while, if there's something, I'm trying to think of the last time I offered one, it's been a while. I think we had a fireplace issue and I offered a small credit for that. So I was like, well, they booked based on the fireplace. You know, it's uh, that's unfortunate. And I'd rather give them a little credit than for that to turn up in a bad review. And I can say, you don't want to say like, hey, if I give you a credit, will you not write me a bad review? <laughs> but it is fair to say <laughs> that every time I've ever offered a credit, it has not popped up in the review. So I think people are, uh, appreciate the fact that you're being proactive and trying to do something to take care of them if something does go wrong. Um, and, you know, I mentioned this before, but the ratings are really how people are making their decision. They can't come out and take a tour of your property because it's a short-term rental, right? So they're reading through those ratings. And you know, every once in a while, I'll even have somebody ask me, like when we first went into Gatlinburg, we didn't have internet at the one cabin. And it was so frustrating because I put it in the listing, but we still have 50% of people show up and say, what's the internet password? Um, and you know, I had a couple people ask because it was in one of the ratings like about they were bummed that they didn't have internet. And so, you know, people read through those ratings and it's, it's important. <laughs> also, when you talk about Airbnb, so, you know, Verbo has a rating system and I think it's very important there. Um, you know, you drop from excellent to great or Lori, do you know what it is on the different yeah. thresholds? Yeah. It's like amazing how in tune when it's affecting your bottom line, how in tune you get to these metrics. But yeah, once you hit um, like below a 4.7, you go from excellent to wonderful or maybe it's reversed and then if you drop below um you know whatever the next threshold is a uh, 4.4 um you go to very good and it will absolutely affect how much revenue you can bring in so you have got to be on top of reviews it's unbelievable yeah, and Airbnb even takes it a step further. If you drop below a 4.7, you lose your super host status. And, you know, some people don't care about a super host, but it's a filter you can choose. So when you're choosing to book your property on Airbnb, you can choose, you know, has Wi-Fi, has workspace, and you can also choose is a super host. Um, so that one's kind of a huge one because if you lose your super host, um, you know, not that you can't rent, but you might be cutting yourself off from that whole potential pool of renters who are looking specifically for a super host. It's um, the same, Mia, yeah, it's it's the also, same thing with VRBO. You can't drop below a 4.5 if you're a premier partner, which is kind of seen in the same light on that platform. So like same thing, super critical, and you got to be like hyper vigilant to be aware of that. Yes, yes. Um, I think it's also important, I mentioned before asking your, um, your guests to, leak, to send you private feedback. Um, and a lot of guests, even if you don't ask, will use that option instead of publicly marking you down, which is fantastic. I think it's very important if you have that private feedback to respond to it um, and don't respond to it publicly. So sometimes I'll see, I'll see on Airbnb, um, somebody will leave a great review and then they must have said something in private that you can't see when you're on the platform because it was private feedback to the host. And sometimes the host will address it publicly. Like I've seen, I've seen one where the host, you know, made some comment about, you know, sorry that there was the noise or blah, 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 or something. And it was not in the public uh. facing review. So I'm like, if somebody leaves you that feedback, appreciate the fact that it's private and keep it private and just respond privately instead of posting it up there <laughs> for everyone to see. Um, you know, of course, response time is important. And again, that comes down to, I think, the rating. And I think that's really just that you need to be available. And it's easy because you have an app on your phone. So it's basically like responding to a text message. But I think you either need to be available or, um, you know, we have four rentals now and we've started looking at some tools. We're not using them yet, but we've started looking at some just in case we decide like, hey, it's getting to be too many messages. We need to help with some automation. So there are some tools, Smart B&B and Guesty, 
I don't use either of those. I, like I said, I just wanted to throw up some ideas in case you do have a portfolio and you decide you want to introduce some automation. There are tools out there to serve specifically short-term rentals um, that'll help you respond in a, in a, you know, in a timely fashion if you're not able to do that personally. Um, I think we're next. Ooh, good stuff. All right. The fun stuff. Um, I do want to just touch on what Mia said. So we automate everything. You know, we've got a fairly big um, portfolio of properties we manage and stuff for other owners and things like that. So we're busy and, and we need to automate. Um, so we automate a lot of things, almost everything through the different platforms we're on. Um, and just so you know, there are certain third party integrators that will integrate all of the listings together. So they talk to each other and they, um, you get on everybody's calendar. So there's no like mistakes with bookings and things like that, but also like welcome messages. So when someone does book, cause we automate that booking process too, they can, they, we allow for people to do, um, booking, direct booking and exception, you know, we, ex we just changed the, um, the criteria for us having to approve it to it being automatically a booking and instant booking. Um, so we do offer that. And then we also, um, when they are going to be staying about a month prior to their stay, they'll they'll receive something from us. And then a couple of days before they stay, they'll receive something from us. And all of that is automated. Um, and it's been pretty smooth sailing other than if we've got to make an update or something like that. So um, there's a lot of tools and stuff. And, and we consult a lot on, um, you know, giving people advice on all of this, because I think that there's a lot of learning steps at the beginning. Um, and there's a lot of time invested and money that you know, could be going into your pockets that you don't really know, um, especially if you're just doing, you know, longer term single families. Um, so, you know, we're available if, if anyone ever needs any help or consulting. Um, but again, so I said, right now we've, we've been on all four of these VRBO, Airbnb, TripAdvisor, Booking.com. There were a lot of issues with like Booking.com with um, people canceling. We had a high cancellation rate with that. So we, after the first year, we dropped that. And then TripAdvisor, we just didn't get too much. And VRBO and Airbnb gave us so much action that um, we just stayed on those platforms. And again, we've got them integrated. So everything kind of feeds and talks to each other. Um, of course, just like with Airbnb, when you're a super host with VRBO being a premier partner shows up on your listings and it's something that um, people are very interested in seeing. They feel a little bit more um, relaxed knowing that they've that there's been a vetting system. And if you're they're staying with someone that has been vetted through these platforms and based on reviews and things like that. So it's really great to look at the criteria for those things and then set out to achieve them as much as possible. Um, and it's based on number of reviews and how many people have stayed and how, how booked you stay and um, your scores and you know a number of different things. If, if you um, cancel people's bookings and things like that. So it's really important to see what those requirements are um, and kind of stay stay at them um again so with marketing and advertising so i'll say again our our property has stayed um close to 100 percent occupied fully rented year round for the last two years um that has been with a little bit of hustle and also just you know just some great marketing pieces that we've put into place at the beginning really great photography um again for us a beach property there was a huge difference between being beachfront and then you know uh, further back in the resort where you had to walk to the beach people like to fall asleep to the sound of the ocean and things like that so it's important when you're making that investment to understand if you pay a little bit more or probably a lot more what the value is going to be if you are something like beachfront so factor those things in because it certainly um, is a big ranker for um, where you are in search and how people are looking for your property and things like that. Um, I pretty consistently go in and change up wording 
on some of our listings just to make sure we we're fresh um, in the feeds and just like with Google on some of these platforms changing up wording and pictures and things like that um, will keep you posted a little bit higher in the searches um, so that's something I'll usually once a month change up the the title of the advertisement um, so that it reaches a lot of people and then I check the metrics all of these platforms have really good metrics to see reporting data of what people are looking at and, and your competitors and who they've booked at if they don't book you. Um, Instagram was a surpriser for me. It's, um, it's a big driver of our business. We have a tight Instagram page. It's got about 400 followers on it and all 400 of those are very engaged and active and comment and um, have booked. We've gotten a ton of bookings from our Instagram. Um, so that was kind of a learning experience for me. This is the first time I've, I saw Instagram as being a big business driver. Um, so I really work that avenue um, as much as possible. And now it's, it's kind of streamlined um, and, and you know, we don't put as many um, pictures up or things like that, but I, I try to do it every so often because it is such an engaged audience. I do like to offer occasionally um, in local Facebook groups. Um, so local to where I live, I live in Raleigh, which is about three and a half, three hours from where our property is. And so I like to put in Facebook groups, you know, friends and family and local um, neighborhood discounts. And I'll put them in like the Raleigh community advertisement or, you know, just some groups that have big, um, big followings and we get a lot of bookings from that when people you know just see that they get 10 percent off of a stay and they see the link to it that usually will kick up a um, bunch of bookings for us and then again like i said just every so often announcing on some of your own personal advertisements the friends and family discount will get people to um to look in book Review management, we talked about this, but again, I cannot emphasize enough how um, if you drop into um, a certain tier, it will affect your bottom line. You can't, you can't ask for the big premiums if your scores are not stellar. So um, people are just not going to stay at a place that's asking top dollar when you know there are multiple reviews that are showing that you know something went wrong or this was broken. Um, so having, again, um, if you do get some of that private information that um, Mia was talking about, making sure that you attend to it immediately. Um, having a really, really good cleaner is um, essential. We lean on them a lot. They send us pictures of the place every so often. They're just super important. And then having a good GC or maintenance company in the area that, that can get to things immediately if necessary um, is vital. And then um, again, photography, video, different things like that. I, I mentioned those because they're just, they're probably one of the most essential tools. Um, video is great because people love to see. I like to do um, video of the length of time it takes from door to beach um, because that's just such a huge selling factor for us. But then other things that you might want to video, um, people like to see that. And then I also, just because I come from the apartment multifamily background, I knew that there were apartments in the in, in that location um, that might have people contacting them for short-term stuff and they may not wanna do short-term stuff. So I actually brought some brochures and information and I bring them like little goodies and stuff. And so when they get people that are looking for even like a month long stay, they refer them over to us. And that has been awesome for us um, as far as keeping people during our, um, our slower months. Um, and then you can go to the next slide. So again, we, um, we definitely went that extra mile. It was not hard to get on HGTV. We had, I had contacted them, um, again, just based on their website and the things that they were filming. And I had said, you know, that we're real estate investors and we fix and flip and yada, yada, and what do you got? And then we, we talked about doing the beach opportunity. Um, they, of course, screen test you. And once, once you talked with them, 
talking to them is not the hard part. It's just making sure that they've got a good show that fits in their location and screen testing and all of that stuff. And then the production time actually hurt us a little bit on how long it took to get the, the property renovated. But all in all, um, a really awesome marketing tool to be able to put out there on magazines like Apartment Therapy or Better Homes and Gardens to get featured in that. That was um, really cool. And then of course, when the show airs, um, we couldn't do any advertising before the show aired. So that was a little bit hard, but then once the show aired, it just took off like crazy. So that was actually just a um, going an extra step. It really wasn't that hard. You'd be surprised. Um, and that gave us a lot of uh, power with one, um, getting extra nice things in our, our place. And then two, getting a lot of additional eyeballs and then just everybody, you know, that knows you knowing that this is going on and excited to book. Um, so that was something that I wanted to mention. You can go to the next slide. Um, you know, I think there's just a couple other things to talk about, you know, you don't want to put your favorite painting in your vacation rental because it might get broken. You can't put stuff in there <laughs> that you're really, really emotionally attached to because you have to be prepared that it might get broken or stolen. Um, so nothing too personal. You also need to keep in mind that wear and tear will happen. I do not charge people if a, a cup breaks or if they take a towel, you know, I think little things, um, <laughs> it's frustrating, but um, it, it's not something that you want to get nitpicky over. The only time I've ever charged anyone for anything is when they broke that shelf. So, you know, I, I think you just need to go in with that understanding. We charge a little more on our cleaning fee to cover things like wear and tear or a missing coffee mug, and we just don't stress about it. Um, and then I think the last point here is you need to invest in ongoing upkeep. Uh, people will overlook maybe one small thing, but there's, if there's a lot of small things, it adds up to something really big. So if you have like, you know, a light bulb out, okay, whatever, it's just a light bulb. But if you have a light bulb out and you have a broken piece of trim in the kitchen and you have, you know, I, some other little thing that's broken, people will start to say that your place is looking run down. So I think it's really, really important for you to reinvest in the property instead of just taking all that money and running. <laughs> you got to keep, keep your property looking good to keep uh, people happy and leaving you those good reviews. Um, these are just a couple of other resources. You could certainly do your own research, but I love listening to some different podcasts, and I'm a member of a lot of short-term rental Facebook groups. Um, these are a couple of the podcasts that I love listening to just to give you some ideas. There are some books that are out there that people have written who are successful hosts. Um, and then, like I said, I really love my Facebook groups because it's a great way to just go in and ask a question. If you, know, if you encounter something a little bit weird and you're not sure how to approach it, that group think is really, really helpful, especially if you're new getting into the industry. <clears throat> and I just want to, we're sort of on time for questions. And Sorry, I wanted to, ahead, yeah, I just wanted to address one thing um, that came in through the chat. Um, probably should have been a little bit more clear on this. Um, they asked about home away and um, home away is the parent company of VRBO. So when we're mentioning um, VRBO, that's the same company, it's HomeAway. So um, I agree, it is absolutely the biggest, one of, one of the biggest um, out there. And so those, we were using those terms interchangeably, but probably should have addressed, I think HomeAway bought VRBO. So now it's all um, part of that umbrella. Um, so I don't know if there are any questions, but I also wanted to point out that again, um, we learned a lot through, and I'm sure Mia did too, getting these things going. And then you can see that, uh, you know, we're looking for our next one and Mia obviously has now purchased multiple. Um, it has leaps and bounds been um, a fantastic investment for us. Like I said, we're easily three times more than what we achieve on our annualized return of cash flow um, with our single family longer term rentals. So it, it adds a little bit more work, but if you can automate it and if you've got good partners, then it's just, um, it's, a, it's a no brainer if you can find a really great investment that's gonna kind of hit the spots that are gonna, um, 
that are going to keep the place occupied. So, so Stephanie, Sarah, I don't know if you want to, if there are any questions. We did. So Sarah would like to know, how can you find out if a certain city or area is really short-term rental friendly? Mia, you want to take that one? Sure. Sure, I'll take that one. Um, well, when you're getting into a market, you know, your your realtor actually probably has a good idea. Um, and then other than that, um, I, I just look online. Like, it's kind of a hot, hot new trend. You know, so if I'm looking at, you know, I know Gatlinburg and Breckenridge are friendly because they're vacation markets. And I think that's something to keep in mind. If you're looking at a vacation market, it's most likely uh, rental friendly. But if you're looking at a city like Denver, Denver actually has a lot of laws. It's your primary residence. And every city is a little bit different. And to be honest, regulations are actually changing really quickly. Because like I mentioned before, occasionally there'll be a bad actor who kind of taints the water and then the city gets a little bit upset and starts putting some new regulations in place. So, you know, I think um, we didn't talk about this a lot, but when you go into an area, I think you need to be prepared uh, that if something were to shift that you're ready to either switch to a long term rental yep. in that market and, and hopefully you can still um, afford your investment at that point and or at what point you might need to divest and maybe make another decision and do a 1031 exchange. So, you know, those are good questions. Each city is a little bit different. So I think it's important for you to look into that uh, before you make that decision. So our next question is, what are the legal issues associated with short-term rentals? Specifically, um, you know, Sarah's already currently managing her own single family and multifamily rentals. So it sounds like short-term rentals would be a new sector for her. So what was, I, you kind of broke up. What, what was the beginning of it? What are the legal issues associated with short-term rentals? I think legal, from, from my perspective, the only legal issues would be if the city does not allow it. And that's certainly not something that you want to put up there because they can, they can search you. <laughs> they, can, they can find your property listed on Airbnb or Verbo. <laughs> um, and then they can hit you with a fine. I think most cities are usually offering warnings first. But uh, there was an instance uh, here in Denver of a local owner who um, I think they were even sent an affidavit and they lied and said, yes, it's our primary residence. And um, they got in trouble for it. Like, I think there was legal action. Um, so, you know, I think it's just important to make sure you're in compliance with whatever the laws are in your city. Um, in, in my two, it's simply just having a permit because they want to know who's responsible um, for the property if they need to get a hold of you. I agree with that. And sorry, I was having a hard time hearing, but now based on Mia's answer, I, I could figure out what she was asking, but I agree with the same thing. And so I just wanted to reiterate um, what Mia said. I do think having a good broker or, or reaching out to a good broker in certain markets to find out what the laws are and what the requirements are at that time. And like she said, if it's not, um, you know, a short, short term or vacation type of property or area community, um, you just got to be kind of on point and ready to be able to um, use it as a longer term if that, you know, if the regulations ever changed for the city. Um, <clears throat> there was like a big hoop on Raleigh for a little while that they were going to stop doing that. Um, they didn't, but you know, that, that would have affected a lot of people that were getting income from Airbnb and their place or renting it out short term. So you're just going to be able to be like nimble and flexible with all that. <clears throat> So Leslie would like to know, at what point do you decide to let go of the secure long-term rental income and turn it into short-term rentals? I'll take that one. <laughs> um, that was really hard for me. I, you know, it's a little bit scary um, to think of all of this additional work and extra management and stuff like that. So to just to get on it and, and take that jump was a big deal. Um, it really took a lot of um, preparing and then just seeing what your potential profit can be. Um, the numbers just, it's impossible to make what you can make on these short terms with having a long term. You know, you just would have to, you would just have to ask so much of a monthly fee. Um, so to, to us, you know, that, that profit driver um, was so huge that it was it was time for us to invest in something that you know was going to be a little bit scary and possibly a little harder. Um, I would say it's just slightly 
harder. The, the stuff, the work that you got to do is at the beginning, um, really getting everything set up, making sure you get a full understanding and automating everything. But then as it goes, it's pretty smooth. If you've got good vendors, it's not too much different than um, with the single family stuff. So, um, you know, just get a good mentor that has been through it and can kind of give you some tips and tricks and things like that. But it's, you know, this is a great time to take the leap because people are so willing to do um, stay in people's homes and, you know, jump on Airbnb and those platforms are so easy and user friendly that it's, it's just a great time to take that leap. Well, fantastic. Well, Mia and Lori, thank you so much for your time today. You have really provided an amazing amount of information for our members here. Um, you know, just a reminder to everyone watching here, their information is, is here. Check out their rentals, see what they're advertising. You have their contact information. Feel free to reach out to them if you have any questions at all. I'm sure there'll be many questions that come up as there's so much information to unpack, but your expertise here today has been invaluable and we appreciate your time.